Really? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to believe that? I have an SD card. Rip. Tragic. Welcome back to the Hags Podcast, episode four. And it's a Thursday when you're seeing this for the first time. Because our official posting day is Thursday. It is Yay. now Thursday, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Mondays are just not great. A Thursday feels more like a hag day. It's yeah. It's not the weekend. It's like a little more fun. Yeah. Monday was good for May. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. May Monday. May Monday. Now we're on to oh. bigger and better things like Thursday. We don't, yeah. we, we've kind of moved past the Monday. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's happening? Um... Emily, I guess we'll, you're me? singing all over the TikTok. Oh, we're starting with that. Yes. Yeah. I made a TikTok because I was bored and I was home alone in my apartment all alone. And I sang Never Grow Up as I normally do. Mm. And I posted and it on TikTok. It's really good. It is really good. Mm -hmm. And the caption and the song in general is very relatable. Mm -hmm. And as an older person, <laughs> I'm stop. I'm older than you. <laughs> I'm just, I moved out 10 years ago. So it's like, damn. Yeah. Oh, for the first time, I moved out. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting to watch you go through the same exact feelings as I did and as a lot of people do. I know. Mm -hmm. When you're first on your own as a little 19-year-old in a new city, scary. Yeah. I'm only 21. Yeah, I'm 21 now, but I moved here when I was 20. I know, but... Oh, you were 20. Why did I think <laughs> yeah. you moved when you were 19? Yeah, I 20. I don't know. Like, Feels the yeah. same. Is it different? No. It's a <laughs> lot better than 19. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're it's not very... a teen anymore. That's true. Yeah. You're in your 20s. Yeah. yeah, but it's still weird and different and getting used to, and it finally hit me, and now I'm an emotional wreck. But yeah. we love that. <laughs> it's weird, too, when you move so far. Yeah. yeah. You're on the it's... opposite side of the country. Yeah. I've, like, lived here before, and all of my family's on the west side. So it's not too foreign, but it's weird, though, still yeah. being in my own apartment. <gasps> She's right there. <laughs> literally <laughs> wall to wall yeah i don't know it's just weird and the song hits and it's a oh my god when i was a kid that was the song that i could not listen to and i was like a major swifty when i was like six and every time never grow up came on i it was like an immediate skip like i could not like it made me so sad because i've always just had like an impending doom of growing up and i don't know why but i've always been like that and like nostalgia is like my number one killer so me then too. that song destroys me and then my senior year of high school at dance our teacher gave it to us as our senior group dance song. Oh, and no. I was like, you can't do this to me. <laughs> I'm sobbing. I know. I was like, I could never listen to this song the whole way through. And then we finally did that. And now I've like been able to fully listen to it since she re-recorded it. And I'm like, ouch, this one hurts. Yeah. It's so sad. That song makes me very emotional, but for different reasons. Even when I was growing up and was still a kid, it always reminded me of my nephew because he was a baby. Mm -hmm. And now he's almost 16. It's, See? Yeah. Time is fleeting. <laughs> Time is fleeting. I can't. But have you, since you said 16, um, have you heard the Gin Alpha slang? Oh, my God. Like oh, the, like the... Kibbity toilet in yeah. Ohio. Mid. In, no, mid is not even cool. Like, they no. were saying, like, they have already out. Weird things. Yeah. Yeah, like they're like the the anyway. It's it does all does not sit right with me. 
I know. Those people already like graduating high school and like being in middle school. I'm like, you were born in like 2010. Like what? Yeah. It's crazy. It makes me feel old. For the first time in my life, I feel old. I don't know why. It's yeah. me. I'm eight years older than you. I know, but like I'm no longer like the youngest everywhere I go. And I'm like, whoa, that's very weird to me because I've gone my whole life being the youngest in every room, every set, every class. And now all of a sudden I'm like, there's like 18 and 19 year olds here. And I'm like, and that's not my age. You're still going to be the youngest in most places. Yeah. yeah. It's just I'm weird. still the youngest in most places I go. <laughs> yeah. But that might yeah. say something about me. I and used to be the youngest in my in my a lot of the people I hung out with, too. Yeah, it's weird growing up. Yay. Hate it. <laughs> I love it. I do. You too. do? I'm yeah. starting to really love it. Yeah. I feel I, more yeah. grounded. And I mean, I'm still we're still very young, like late 20s. Feels like you're only getting your first foot into mm. who you are and into the world. But I do feel a little bit more sturdy than what I was at 21. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, it was a nightmare, a fucking tornado. I'm excited to be 30. Everyone says it's great. Don't say 30. <laughs> I'm almost 30. I have a year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah, but like people say 30s are where it's at. And I'm like, I would love that because so far everyone's told me that the next six years of my life is going to be hell. And I'm like, I've already had that the last six years. Like, can we not? Like, let's move on or something. It's Being young is hard. Your early 20s are really, really hard. Yeah. yeah not, not gonna lie. I know. <laughs> but you have to go through it to get to the really good stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah. yeah Scary. Sure right. yeah. yeah. It'll yeah. be good, but oh well. It's just chaotic and mentally unstableness to the fullest, if that's a word. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the story of my song. Well, I loved it. Yeah, yes. I did too. And I, I don't know. I got really emotional watching it. I know. Aww. Same. Yeah. Especially since you were just sitting on the floor. Like, no couch, no furniture. In a barren apartment. All alone. Hey, we've got, we have our um, patio furniture that we'll be using as um, our living room furniture. So it's, yes. we're, we're doing some. We'll get there. Some, we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you start. It is. I know. And then you move a million times. And... I know. I've sold and lost so many things. I don't want to move again. Oof. Remember when we were packing up my apartment in Huntsville and how much furniture we threw out? I know that Crazy. I've done it. I like, no. When I move, I take the necessities and the rest is bye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a lot. I don't it want to think about it. Yeah. I will be hiring someone to move me next time. Because when we moved here, we didn't have furniture. Like, it's just been furniture getting shipped here and me having to build it, which is already enough work to do. So I'm like, moving my built furniture, having to unbuild it, rebuild it. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you do not unbuild it. You How do you put, get you the bed through the door? Okay, you may have to unbuild that. But... I don't want to oh. unbuild my bed. A bed <laughs> frame is usually easy to take apart Ugh. but stuff like dressers and all that kind of stuff just leave it together yeah, yeah that bitch is staying put i still yeah. haven't even built my dresser <laughs> when we lived in huntsville we never even bought a dresser really yeah we had a our closet was big so yeah i just need drawers yeah yeah emily back to you <laughs> back to me. tell us about tell us about class this week oh dear god mm -hmm. So here's the thing. This will probably bring hope to actors or something or make them feel seen. Because here's the issue. I am deathly shy and have like bad social anxiety. But like it doesn't impact my acting. Like it's never affected that. Like I don't get nervous to go to set. I don't get nervous to do a scene. Because it's like I feel safe with a script. So that like has never been an issue that I'm like so shy. And like when I was a kid, like I would go to set and like my mom would talk to me and my mom would even like go to class with me and she would talk for me. Like it was a great life. 
And now that I'm an adult and on my own, I have to learn how to speak for myself and I have to get over all this stupid social anxiety and live performance anxiety because that is the one thing I have. Like with dance, I always was like having a complete like panic attack backstage dying and I've never been able to do improv either. Like it's something about not having a script and not having something that just like sends me off a deep end. Like literally when my mom went to class with me, she would volunteer me to do improv and I was like, shut up like don't do this to me like I can't like give me a script and I'll do anything so I've started doing these things called coaches challenges in class on Thursday nights and essentially you just request one he doesn't tell you what it is in advance and you just show up and he tells you what you're doing so last time I did the poem and you all saw part of that that turned into a rap song because it's easier for me to make a situation funny than completely bomb and just be sad about it. So like that night was good. But yesterday he was like, if you want to work on something like this again, just let me know in advance. And I was like, oh, great. He's going to give it to me two days in advance. No, that was so he could think about what to give me for two days. So I roll up to class last night and he was like, you know what you're doing, right? And I was like, no, I don't. I already knew what like, you were doing. I know. We all knew. I was high on my delusion shit I was like mm -hmm. he's not gonna give me comedy routine I was like he's gonna like give me something you know like step into my writing abilities I was like no. all high hopes and delusion positive expectations and he was like you're doing a stand-up comedy routine and I was like this is what I was worried about and like literally all day I had the worst anxiety and if I have any amount of anxiety I'm like done for it like completely sick like I literally wanted to throw up I was so close to throwing up on my drive there I was like I want to turn around I want to go home I don't want to do this why am I forcing myself to be uncomfortable I was like I hate this so then I got there and then finally when he told me that I was like kind of at peace but like he said that it could be about anything that happens in class or like anything happening in life and I was like I don't want to roast people that's mean so <laughs> Jimmy did that but like I, I just feel bad making fun of people so I sat in the hallway for three hours trying to write a stand-up comedy routine and I decided to go with a story time and I did the time that I got kicked out of a bar underage which I was nervous about doing that story anyways because I know it's one where like it was a pretty bad night not the greatest in my life so I was like and it's going to make people mad that care about me. But like, I like to retell bad stories in a funny way and make it comedy. So that was the only issue for me. I was like, there were some jokes where I was like, mm, now they want to fight someone. I was like, oh, this isn't going well. And there were some people that were like stone cold faced the whole time. But then like other people laughed. Like it was funny. It's just if you care and love about me, it was not a vibe. Mm. So but that was good. I don't know. The angst got me is always... Yeah, and the angst is always worse than the actual performance. Like I Yeah. It once was, you and then you're on a high, like once you are like, Oh, I did it and I'm here and I'm fine and it I made people laugh and it was enjoyable. Like Yeah. And you just yeah, yeah, it gets easier. It was yeah, it was good. It does get easier. And I guess it's something that I need to do because I would have been more mad if I bailed and didn't do it. And that's yeah. just something that I have to work through because I'm like, I just I can't do live performance things and I can't do stuff like that. Like it just sends me through a wall terribly and horrifically. And all today I've still had my leftover anxiety from it. And I'm like, go away, bitch. It's yeah. so annoying. It's a different skill. Like it is when you're when you're acting, you have the structure, but improv mm -hmm. and, and stand up, it's, it's an entirely different skill. Like you have to be kind to yourself because we're actors. We're not improvers. We're not stand up comedians. Like it's mm -hmm. an entirely different, um, approach. Taking Meisner could help you with that. Yeah. It's you. Yeah, out I of know that <laughs> I need I've to avoided Meisner. Meisner too. Meisner. Okay, but you have the clouded Meisner from the experience we had in our That's other studio fair. where we were nose to nose, hot breath on one another. That was you have a red shirt. I have a red shirt. You have a red shirt. Yeah, no, very different. Yeah. Well, it's... Okay. Repetition is very vital in Meisner technique, but it is very vital, but you know. You don't have to be about to kiss. You can yeah. be, especially during a pandemic. Anyway. Yeah. You can be a normal distance apart and it works better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I need to do more of that. And that's like what I'm trying to do because I know it's something that I need to get over and like work on. And I've literally avoided like the Thursday I don't classes. think you'll ever get over it. I don't oh, know. No, I, but it's you learn how to use it. It's a tool. Yeah. Like I think, I mean, there are so many actors, theater actors that 
I mean, you know, Sean Hayes from Smartless, mm-hmm. every performance he had, he was absolutely terrified and he used it as a tool to help him, you know, perform, be in his body, open up. It's just, I think you just have to learn how to navigate with it instead of allowing it to hold you back. Yeah, because after the performance, you always are on your high and it feels great. And that's like what I've like understood because I'm like trying to like, I'm in this stage where I'm like trying to force myself to do uncomfortable things and like not back out and also like recognizing like if I'm like, oh, am I actually sick or am I just anxious? And if it's an anxious sick, you're going to do it anyways because you need to do it. So I'm like trying to work through that and like just push myself to do more because I've literally avoided improv classes so long. Like literally at our studio, we do, we open a class with this exercise called silly, sexy, stupid. And I literally didn't go to the class for two years solely because of that exercise. That's crazy. You're on, you literally, it's a three seconds. Literally, you just, you walk up into a circle, you do something stupid, you say something and it's over. So why did that just give me the worst stress in the whole world? I don't know, but it did. It's just like a shell that I have to break through every time. Yeah. The more you immerse yourself in it, the easier it will get. Yeah. Agreed. That's like, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm forcing myself to do everything that I've avoided and have been scared of and shy of. And mm-hmm. improv makes you a better actor. A thousand percent. Yeah. I love improv. Performing improv like got me so far out of my shell. So did Meisner. Mm-hmm. And it made me a much better actor. And our troupe bombed before and it's fine you just yeah you, know. you just and then yeah other nights it was incredible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and that's other- like bombing is like one thing that I think I've also been like scared of you have like to I've, bomb I know if you want to be a good actor you have to bomb a million mm-hmm. times yeah and then like that's mm-hmm. something that I'm like overprotective of because now I'm in this era where like I am okay with that and I'm like I want to experiment I want to go and do stuff I want to like you know, like I acknowledge that like I'm at a starting phase, like with everything, like starting singing, starting doing like comedy routines and stuff. I'm like, I understand that I'm at a starting phase, but then I start to think about like how people are perceiving me. And I'm like, oh, do they think I like think I'm funny or like think I'm good? Cause I don't want them to think that in case I'm bad. Like, it's a weird thing. I don't know. Like, I don't want to walk up there and be like, here's my funny story. I find it funny. Oh no, they don't like awkward. Like, no, I don't think I'm funny. Like, it's so weird and it's annoying. That's one of the good parts about getting older. You don't give a f***. You don't. (laughs) No. I know. That's why I roasted the hell out of everybody on my stand-up. I was like, roast, roast. Yeah. I'm still in that awkward phase. Yeah. 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 So I'm still in that awkward phase of like, I'm trying, I'm finally trying new stuff and I'm open to like trying new things, but I'm also still a little in my head of like, oh what if they think I I think I'm good like uh, I don't know Mm -hmm. it's weird yeah I think we all have our own weird anxieties when it comes to acting like I have my own things too that are different from your you know I just Mm -hmm. think it's just a normal thing that we have to learn how to deal with in this um uh, with the craft yeah it is yeah because I yeah mine's sweating I sweat uncontrollably even if I'm not nervous and I'm fine like I will have a sweat stain and I'm like how am I going to ever act in pink or anything that's not black I know it's so weird all the things you have to think about like yesterday that even reminded me I started keeping a notes list of all the foods that I can eat when I'm on set or when I'm nervous or something because I'm like that shit you gotta know I was like here are my comfort yes. meals here are the snacks I need to have in every dressing room and every bag here are the snacks I need to have in my car before class I was like making sure I had everything I could ever possibly need definitely I pack the same food to go to every set, even if there's crafty, because mm-hmm. I just want to be prepared in case there's stuff that I can't eat. Yeah, you yeah. have to. It's crazy. All the things you have to think about. So many things. I know. Too many. But we'll get there. I don't know if I'll continue my stand up journey. At the people liked my story though, and they want me to do more with it and like make it into a film or something, or like turn it into like a condensed monologue to like have in my back pocket. So it went well, and people really liked it. So it was a good experience. It was just, it really threw me. (laughs) Because it's weird just bringing something from your life and having people listen for like five minutes. Like it was Mm -hmm. crazy, but 
And my teacher, his first comment was, well, now I want to fight this bitch. And I was like, oh, let's not. I was like, it's all good. It's fun. We love. But then he's like, no, but it was funny. And I was like, okay, good. That's all I care about. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So I did it. And no one died. And I didn't turn around or go home and I didn't throw up. Not throwing up's good. It mm-hmm. is. I was very close to. I was like on the phone while driving there and I was like talking and I was like, mm, maybe not talk. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> It's just so weird because I don't get that ever going to set. So finding something that just throws me through a fucking loop, I'm like, wow, yeah. there's our problem. That was, that was me performing in front of the agents at 360. Mm. I was so nervous. I went to training. I trained the scene. Like, I, you know, people just, ha- everybody has their thing. Zoom used to make me really anxious and acting on Zoom. Really? Yeah. In 2021, like when all that started during the pandemic, I would get sick to my stomach i hated it it felt so impersonal and i just i didn't like it so i signed up for a zoom class zoom (laughs) scene study and i got over it and now i don't care it is harder on zoom that's crazy it It eased my anxiety though i don't know because it took out like the aspect of having to be social which was my other issue (laughs) because like now that we're in person i'm like every time i'm going to class i'm like it's a social event and i'm Mm -hmm. like stress I'd yeah. much rather be in person. Yeah, I love it though. It's just another thing where like I just need to work on my social skills and not being so shy. In 2020, our my normal acting class that I always went to in person, we tried to do it on Zoom for a little bit and we were doing mock callbacks over Zoom. Bombed. It was so bad. That was the first time that I'd ever done that because everything was still in person. Obviously, you ha- did a self-tape and then you'd go in person mm-hmm. for the callback typically. And I, I'm like, I've known these people for five years and I see them multiple times a week, but my stomach is turning. Damn. Yeah. It, you know, everybody is, I'm telling you, there's, everybody has their thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you learn how to deal with it and then you find something else. Like it's, you know, like it's never, it's never ending. <laughs> never ending. <laughs> I know. I like moved here thinking, oh, I'm ready to fight this career and go all in. And I moved here and just discovered all of the many issues that I need to work on. You'll continue to make steps and the things that used to make you nervous will be fine. And the new things are going to make you nervous. Like it's just, yeah, that's why this career is so hard. And then you're figuring yourself out and what you're mm-hmm. good at. And it, yeah, this is, uh, yeah. It's crazy. I can't think of anything that makes me nervous right now, but. I'm sure a million things. That's crazy. I'm jealous. It'll pop. I'm sure it will reveal itself soon. Yeah, it will. I could write a book (laughs) and every page could be dedicated to something that makes me nervous. We could do a TikTok of that. I'm nervous all the time. I don't, I, one day I've gotten better though, but yeah, I'm nervous all the time. It gets better. You just have to keep doing it. Like, that's all that I've realized. I'm like, Looking back at how I was like, even just like five years ago when I first started, I'm like, there's so much improvement. Like someone that we work with on a lot of hag stuff, she knew me like back then when I was like 14, just starting out. And a couple months ago, she like, she said that she described me as that I came in with a turtle as, or I came in as hard, wait, (laughs) I'm totally ruining it. She said that I came in with a shell as hard as a turtle, something Mm. like that. Because I was so shy and I would not talk to anyone. I would not say anything. Like, but you were so you... young. Yeah, that's true too. And I was in a class with all adults. So it was like yeah, very weird. It's very different. Yeah, yeah it was. Because like I talked at my dance classes. So I guess that's a thing. I don't know. I was just very shy, especially yeah. around adults when I was younger. So I've already had a lot of improvement and growth. It's yeah. just one step at a time. In five years, I'm sure this won't be an issue. And if it is, I'm going to be mad. But I've, we'll see. <laughs> I've gotten more nervous. In the beginning, acting, I was never nervous. And as I've done this more, I've gotten more anxiety. Really? Mm-hmm. <gasps> that happened to me as well, but I yeah. got over it. Like, I already I, went through not getting nervous again. Yeah. yeah. I, st- I mean, it doesn't hold me back. Like, I'm still going to do the things that I do, but it's the nerves are there more now than they were in the beginning. In the beginning, you could have put me, I could have led a movie. I would have bombed it. I would have not been nervous. Yeah, like, it's I the was new like, actor confidence. Oh, I was so confident. 
Yes. Yeah. It's weird. That's like, I was like that too. And then I learned. But yeah, it's just a weird thing. Mm -hmm. I had something to say and then I just forgot it. The stakes are higher now. That's probably why you're- That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. The stakes are higher and you feel like you should be here when, you know, it just, you put more pressure on yourself. Yeah. You like start out as an actor and you're like fully like, I'm going to be famous within like a year. And then after a while you realize like, no, it's a process. You literally need like four solid years of training, like treat it like a college, like you learn- like you come in all headstrong and then you're like, oh, okay, there's four process. years is even nothing. Yeah. Four it's years not. is like not nothing. Cause that's it's where not. I'm at is nothing. Yeah. Four years yeah. at a good studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's a whole process. Mm-hmm. The nerves will bounce out and yes. oh yeah. Oh yeah. A little bit of nerves. That's always a good thing. Oh yeah, definitely. But every time I competed in cheerleading or dance, I was nervous every single time but same I get nervous when I go to set but it's not overwhelming it's just because I care yeah literally going to set the only thing that like makes me anxious and nervous is thinking about all the people I have to talk to and where to park like those are the only two thoughts going through my mind I think about where to park too I overthink it I will be on Apple Maps, zooming in, making sure I found the exact spot, making sure I don't get there too early so I'm not the very first person. So then I don't think, oh, no, I'm in a parking lot that's the wrong one. Like, I'll literally circle till I see another car just to make sure that I did it right. Like, it stresses me out so much, and I don't know why. It's so weird. Everybody has a thing. Mm-hmm. Parking's yeah. stressful in daily life. So. Yeah. Yes. Especially not where I'm living here. I was going to say, not where <laughs> I'm living right now. Oh my gosh, LA parking is, it, it, it could have 30 minutes mm-hmm. to a, where you want to go. Or it could, yeah. I don't know. No, literally last night in class, I was late because normally there's always parking and there was no parking. And mm-hmm. I was like, I can't park like three streets over. Are you kidding me? I'll get murdered. Yeah, the parking is rough on Melrose. It is. Normally it's fine though, but yesterday it was not being kind. But like when we moved here, that was like one of my major stressors about even just going to class in person. It stressed me out too. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, everyone made it sound like it was so scary. Melrose really isn't. Like it's pretty safe. But like it sounded like it was so scary. And I was like in parallel parking. I didn't know how to parallel park before I moved here. And I was like having to find parking. Like that like was my major stressor and being in person. Like forget acting in front of people. I was like parking and being on time Mm -hmm. you learn how to parallel park quickly oh yeah i did so quickly (laughs) have to Mm -hmm. yeah but now it's not a stress like i was so nervous to move to la simply because of parallel parking and not even an issue anymore it's just one of those things you stress about it and then it's not an issue within a few weeks Mm -hmm. so let's jump into our main topic there's gonna be a montage like a year from now of me saying so let's jump into our main topic I know (laughs) as I say it every time but today we're going to talk about why we started acting and why we started filmmaking thoughts one of you all can start since you just put me on the spot for the whole first half (laughs) Cheyenne you want to start um well I've wanted to be an actor and a filmmaker my entire life you came out of the womb literally (laughs) i started dancing when i was two like as soon as i could walk i was in dance class and i started performing when i was three i was just drawn to it there's not really a full explanation but as i got older and really understood more about movies and television there are new reasons definitely developed besides oh that's what i want to do because i was three yeah i love storytelling i think movies and television are extremely powerful and not to be dramatic but i think they can change people's lives oh they can and i realized that in elementary school i started watching desperate housewives way too young i think i was eight years old when it premiered and i started watching it when it premiered i remember specifically this episode where Lynette, who's played by Felicity Huffman, 
starts taking her kids Adderall because she's so tired and she's just, she feels like she's losing it. And then she hears that other moms are taking Adderall. So she's like, huh, I'm going to try it. And she gets addicted to it. <laughs> and one of the women in the neighborhood, her name was Mary Alice. She had unalived herself and she was best friends with Lynette anyway. So Lynette is having a full on breakdown because she can't get more Adderall. She has crazy twin boys and another kid and she's exhausted. And she just, she hands her kids to Mrs. McCluskey, the neighbor, and is like, I, I can't, I can't. And she runs off and she's sitting in a soccer field by herself, just having a full meltdown. And then, oh my God, I'm going to like start crying. Like, this is what I'm talking about. It's just so powerful. Um, her friends find her and they're all like, I I feel the same way. Like we all do in Lynette's but Like, but your life seems so perfect. Like you all hold it together. And they're like, no, we don't. And they just can, can or, um, they comfort each other in this soccer field. And they're all just crying. And I was literally eight watching that. And I was like, I, as far as an eight-year-old can comprehend something like that, I was like, oh my God, I get it. And I feel it again mm -hmm. as an eight-year-old. It's different when you're an adult. Feeling. I can see you as a little eight-year-old watching that going through all those. Yeah. But it's it was crazy. so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I still watch that show now and I go back and it's even more powerful because I'm an adult with a developed brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so many episodes from that show stick out in my mind watching it growing up. I think it ended when I was sometime in high school. I think I was a junior, so 16 years old, maybe. And I just grew up with it and it just amazed me. I remember another episode this is going to turn into a Desperate Housewives rewatch <laughs> podcast. I want to go back and rewatch it. You're making me want to go back and rewatch it. It's so good. But Gabrielle, who's played by Eva Longoria, her and her husband adopt a baby. And they've had the baby for about a month. And the parents of the child changed their mind. And nothing was official yet, legally. So the parents came and took the child. And... Gabrielle is just screaming and Carlos, her husband's holding her back. And she's like, you can't take my baby. You can't. take." It's just. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I think. That show really. Gave me the itch to to do it. And, you know, there's happy things in the show, too. It's not, it's not all negative. It's actually mm -hmm. really, it's a really funny show when I saw how powerful film and television could be, mm -hmm. I was so drawn to it. And I was like, I, this is how I'm supposed to change people's lives. This is how I'm supposed to make people's lives better, mm -hmm. which is very deep for a child to be thinking, but mm -hmm. that's what happened. That's beautiful. Thank you. The one thing I remember from um, Desperate Housewives is Eva Longoria mowing the grass. In the dress with the push numbers. Yeah, I don't know why. That's the only thing that comes to my mind with that show. I've never it, seen it. It was a, it was the show. Mm -hmm. It was the show. Huge. Yeah. And uh, we can move on for me after this. Another thing... For me growing up, I'm not saying I had a horrific childhood or anything, but I did go through some stuff and film and TV was always there to, yeah. to help me escape. And I think that's another important thing about it is it helps people escape from life. Okay. I know especially sitcoms do that for people in comedies, which I think is a great thing. Mm-hmm. My acting story. My acting story is not that interesting. I started when I was 25, but basically my whole life I've been a performer. Like I danced when I was, I started dancing when I was like three for a, a couple of years. And then I played piano and then I played saxophone and then I was in marching band. And then in college I did like 
my sorority did like um I don't even know what you call it they call it a step sing you like Ooh. got in front of people you know what I'm talking about you did that yeah I have a like, video so I don't know if I have a video I love it, what, those there, there was one on YouTube there was one year I choreographed and wrote the show and it oh. was so good okay and um because it wasn't like dancing dancing yeah it was like you know you like stepped and then um what is it called anyway yeah yeah I did one of those um but I had all I, I have always wanted to act but acting made me really nervous um whenever I was a kid I auditioned for uh Snow White I think I was 10 or 11 and um the uh people I walked up to do my monologue and they told me no because I was a chubbier kid and they what? yeah yeah <gasps> really mm-hmm. do you want me to bleep that actually yeah maybe bleep, bleep the that. name but leave our reactions yeah yeah and they told Ooh. me to audition for the dwarf <gasps> and I was so like embarrassed and nervous and I was like, this is not what I prepped. Like, I'm scared. And then I ended up just not doing it. And um, yeah. Do you remember yeah. the teacher's name? I might know her. I don't know. I was so young. I don't know. Because there was like a, there are multiple people. Yeah. Damn. That's awful. Yeah. That is. I know. It was in my, so with Brian Pataka, we have like an actor story of like pivotal moments that like made us the creators that we are. And that was what I started out with because once that experience happened, I didn't try acting again until college. Um, but performing to me feels like a closer sense of who Jimmy is. So like when I'm performing, I understand who I am better, which is why I've always loved it. If it's acting, dancing, playing piano, singing though bad, you know, like any sort of performance makes me feel like I'm an, uh, I have a better understanding of myself. Um, But anyway, I didn't act after that. I was like, I did dance, piano, saxophone, flag, and then step sings. And then in college, I was like, you know what? We have a good um, like theater program. And I was like, let I'm going to audition for one. And they had Hamlet. But to audition, everybody had to memorize the same monologue. And they were going to like assign you the role, I guess. So I memorized the monologue. I like did it in front of my friend over and over again. And I was like, okay, I got it. I walked all the way down there. I was literally waiting to go up, just like sweating. I, I like, it, I was so nervous. I was nonverbal. Like I was truly, I was so scared. Um, so I ended up throwing the monologue away and leaving with my tail tucked between my legs. Cause I just, my anxiety held me back. And then um, I stopped thinking about acting because also I was raised in like a smaller town and it just was not something that you pursued. A soft science was just not something that was sought after. Like Huntsville is a STEM um, city. Like people are in the military or they're working in like uh, engineering or any sort of hard skill. So acting just didn't feel feasible. And then I went to Taiwan And then I came back because of the pandemic and I met a guy who was an actor and it was actually my ex-boyfriend's friend at the time. And he hadn't seen him in, I don't even know, like six years. And I met him and I was so enthralled. I was like, oh my gosh, how do you do this? How do you make a living? And um, uh, we spent the whole time talking about his acting career and like my ex didn't get to catch up with his friend and he was so mad at me. (laughs) But um. He actually told me about James Ciccone. I started acting there and then found Anthony. Uh, And yeah, I've been doing it ever since. I don't have, I mean, growing up, obviously, um, TV was an escape. Performance was an escape. It was, uh, you know, any any sort of realm. Like I've, I've always wanted to do it, but 
it just didn't really feel feasible until I got older and I was on both my feet and, um, looked at it in a more practical approach. Um, which is when I started pursuing it at 25, the ripe age of 25, I felt bygone. I felt so old and that's crazy. That's a good time to start. It is a good yeah. time to start. Yeah. Um, and I was actually, uh, rewatching friends. Um, I love friends and Courtney Cox is from Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. And I remember thinking that growing up, I was like, how is this girl from Birmingham, Alabama leading on friends? And I love Monica. So it was almost like a full circle moment in my life. Like I've gone through all these things and all these anxieties and I can finally do what I want to do. And, and then I'm seeing somebody that lived an hour away from me doing it. Uh, yeah. So what That's... you're saying is you weren't delusional as a child like I was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But look what delusion gets you. Delusion gets you far. Okay. <laughs> I'm delusional now. I'm more delusional now than I was as a kid. You you have to be delusional to be an actor. Oh yeah, there's no other way. I thrive yeah. off of pure delusion. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Would not be here without it. Yeah, Cheyenne's yeah. over here crying from Desperate Housewives, and I'm over here eating Cheez Its, and I don't even know what I was doing as a kid. <laughs> Playing Sims. Oh my god, yes, I love Sims. But yeah, that's my acting journey, Emily. Let's see. I know. It's like weird to find a start, you know? Yeah. I mean, so I started dancing when I was like three and I, oh, oh, wait, I hit my laptop. Let me restart. Okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> I started <Are> dancing. <laughs> okay. That's the first time that's happened. That's okay. Good. Actually, before you start, let me just. <laughs> Ew. What is happening? Emily, you look good. Uh, yeah, my hair is better because Jimmy installed my shower filter. <gasps> anyway. Oh my gosh, I'm going to drop that video because I was like, I love feeling like a handy woman. Anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah. <laughs> so I started dancing when I was like three and I literally hated it because it was ballet at, it was when I was in Australia. So it was like, it was the Australian Academy of Dance. So it was like classical ballet. And I was a little three-year-old like, nope, this isn't for me. So I quit dance. And then I I was a very delusional child. So I had many hobbies. And I started doing dance again when I was like 10, I think, in fifth grade. And then I got, so the circus came to town in Huntsville. And it put me on a circus kick. Like I wanted to be in the circus and I fully thought I would be. Like I was ready to be a tightrope walker. That is all I wanted. Like that was like my first spark of like in a creative industry of like performing arts is for me. Like all I wanted was that. I was like ordering a slack line for my backyard to practice tightrope walking. I know. And my parents the, were like, Was okay. it the Barney and Barnum? Barnum circuit? and Bailey. Yeah. yeah, it was one of their last I was times. Obsessed. With all of the animals, which, ooh. but yeah, so I was like obsessed with the circus and that's all I wanted. And all I wanted to do was perform. And then somewhere along the way, I lost that because I had so many hobbies and I played so many sports and it was like a high turnover rate. So then one day I was like 12, I think it was the summer before seventh grade. And I was just sitting there. So also, I was very obsessed with dolls as a kid. So this is why I might seem weird when I say that I was still playing with Barbie dolls when I was like 12. Or No, wait, I was 11 when I was 11. That's better. But I was very obsessed with dolls and like make believe and everything and like baby dolls, Barbie dolls, like that was my thing. So I was sitting there one day playing with my Barbie dolls and I just had this random doomful thought or something. I was like, I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. At the ripe age of 11, I was like, I need to figure this out right now. Like, I don't have a career yet. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I like went through all of the subjects in school. I was like, that's not happening. English is not happening. Math is not happening. Science is not happening. I was like, I'm not an academic child. And I was like, what do I do? I have nothing to do. I have no purpose. I'm like, oh, no, I'm lost. And then I was like, well, what do I like doing? And then I realized throughout my whole life and in all of my little make-believe games, playing family, playing with my Barbie dolls, I was like, my character was always the star. My character was always like on stage performing or like on camera acting and doing stuff. So I was like, that's it. I'm going to be an actress. 
And from that moment on, that was the only thing I've ever focused on for my whole life. And I was very delusional, very obnoxious. And I was very obsessed with Nickelodeon and Disney at the time. So that's like, I would literally like watch the episodes on repeat, of like my favorite shows. I would print out the scripts. I would run my little lines by myself in my room. Like that's all I would do. And my parents were very against it, which was unfortunate and very traumatic at some points, but they were wildly against it because they also just knew I was like, this is my millionth hobby. They were like, no, we're not investing in this one. Like we cut it at the circus, not happening. You're never (laughs) going to be an actress. You're not going to stick to it. And I was like, oh, really? And the issue was I was a very obstinate child. If you told me I couldn't do something, that was exactly what I was going to do. And I don't even know if I really liked acting for the first few years. I really don't think I did. I don't think I cared for it. I just did it out of spite. And I liked being successful and booking stuff. (laughs) But now I love it. I know it literally was. I was like, I still like that, but you're productive doing it. You know what I mean? Now I like acting. So that's a plus. But like, I had everyone telling me that it would never happen. I would never do anything with it. All of my friends were telling me like, no, you're never going to do that. Even my mom was and my sister was and like, they were all brutal. Now they're all very supportive. But like back in the day, they were not. And then my mom was finally like, okay, if you're going to do this, you have to take classes. And I was like, I don't need classes. And she's like, we're not going to support you if you don't take classes. (laughs) And I was like, okay, fine. So I did theater. And when I was 13, I did you do theater in Huntsville? Yeah, fantasy. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) So I started theater when I was like 13. And I really didn't care for theater. I did a I did like a couple shows. I did I was Jovi one year in Elf Junior the musical. So that was fun. Who's Jovi? The girl that he falls in love with. Oh Zoe De Chanel? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Not you being the love interest. I know. So that was fun. And then I did like, I did theater in high school for one year because I was too scared to do it my first year in high school. Wait. Oh, I was too scared to do theater in school in eighth grade. And then I finally did it in ninth grade. So yeah, that's like where I started. And then I was like, you know, theater's not for me. Like I really want to do on camera. Like, I don't know. Theater always stressed me out. And I had started dancing again at that time. And like live performances just stress me out. And I just didn't care. Yeah. And like, I just didn't care for theater as much. I was like, "Uh, it's not my future. So then I started on camera acting classes when I was 13 too, I think that summer or 14, one of the years there. And then I've just been doing that ever since. Yeah. So pure delusion bringing me this whole way. You know, I feel like everybody's acting career starts off with a little bit of delusion. That's that's what gets it on its feet. You know, you got to have it running. The first couple of years based off of delusion because oh my god that just reminded me i found like last year something a document or not a document like a piece of paper that i had written on when i was 12 and i titled it like resume and then i wrote my resume which was nothing because i didn't know what a resume was it was essentially a cover letter to nickelodeon oh i was gonna bring this up i know and I was like in it like I'm not the best actor but I'm good and like I had written oh my god I forgot about all this I wrote an entire tv show when I was 12 too like it was called double the trouble I was gonna be Haley like it was fun so I wrote this entire tv show and I literally emailed it to Nickelodeon like I'm not even kidding I found my email my old email account the other day which was a cringy username and I literally had found some exec at Nickelodeon online and I emailed them like 30 episode ideas the whole script plus my resume where I was like I'm not the best actor but like what would be better than having the person who wrote the role play it like it was so embarrassing but cute hey that's great if I was working at Nickelodeon and I saw a little 12 year old sent me this email I would keep that email yeah good times what was your username uh it's still an active email, so no one email me. Bleep out half of it. But the first half was cook at ymail.com. Why is that embarrassing? Funny? Yeah, it is. E-blue. I don't even know what that is. Well, my name's Emily, and my first initial is E, and my favorite color was blue. So That's not embarrassing. Parents- it's not like Joe's Goofy Girl or like Flip Flop yeah. Girl. Like, you know, that's not bad. 
not bad at all. It was clearly a child's email. It was not secretive. Yeah, because then I was like, since my mom wasn't like managing my career at all and she didn't care to help at all, like in that, which is valid. And she also thought like the industry was from the devil and stuff, which is fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I started these modeling classes too. And it's where I got my first agent when I was like 14. Did you go to PAMA? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's where I went to. Yeah. You went there? Mm -hmm. I was there for like two and a half years. Damn. Yeah. yeah. So I started with them. And like when I was emailing the lady, like I m emailed her from my own email account without my mom's permission. And she was like, you know, you really had me fooled. Like your skills at writing sounded really professional because I even wrote it in third person like it was my mom. And I signed her name at the end of it. And she's like, you had me fooled. And my mom was like, yeah, she wrote the whole thing herself. And I was like, someone's got to do it. That's so I'm making funny. my career, girl. We got That's places so to go. Funny. Yeah. Miss Pama herself. Mm -hmm. What is that? It was like a modeling acting commercial agency. studio. Yeah, it was an agency yeah. that taught classes. Mm -hmm. Like they did runway. There. Yeah, mm -hmm. in Huntsville. I was going to say, full circle moment. That place was right across from the dentist that I went to my entire life. Like, the window that I would stare out of every time I was being tortured at the dentist, it was literally the wall to that agency. And they had been there this whole time. And I'd literally been going to that dentist since I was five. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, my future modeling agency was right there all along. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. You never know. You mm -hmm. never know. You never know. Yeah. So for me, I, um, I feel like I was a filmmaker before I was an actor. Because when I was a kid, I had a Barbie cam. And everybody knows what the Barbie cam. Do you remember the Barbie cam, Cheyenne? Mm -hmm. It's the VHS Barbie cam. You like filmed it on a camera and it was live recording on a VHS in the other room of the of uh, like on a TV. Whoa. It was for me peak technology time. Like I was like filming and then all my friends could watch it from the TV on the VHS. Anyway. Um, I got this Barbie cam. I think I was like 12. No, I don't know. What's eighth grade? Seventh, eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade ish, 13, 14. Maybe I was younger. I don't know. I was, I think I was younger. Actually, it was probably fifth, sixth grade, but me and my friends every weekend would film skits and we did like live skits. We did singing. It was like we would all gather like a group of 10 of us to like create these Barbie cam. Um, uh, I don't even know TV shows. Um, and it was like it brought in the whole neighborhood. I was like telling people what to say. Like we were coordinating outfits, like looking at funny things on YouTube and then recreating them on our Barbie cam. Um, but then after the Barbie cam. We created a YouTube channel, and I will not say that YouTube channel's name mm -hmm. because it is still active and it is not good. Um, and we were, me and my friends were going to make a web series. Um, I was non-committal as a little sixth grader, so that didn't follow through. Um, but I've always enjoyed creating content. It feels collaborative. It um, it made me like a more well-rounded artist, and um, yeah. Gotta love the Barbie cam. Gotta love the Barbie cam. Peak technology of the early 2000s. Yeah, it was it was big. Now yeah. that's cool, though. Yeah, I forgot about that. It was also my Brian Pataka story, and I was like, why did I not? Anyway, you go, Shine. Well, I was around, I think I was four years old, and I was watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, as four-year-olds do, and... <laughs> There was an episode where they went behind the scenes and essentially the camera follows Will Smith around the entire set. And I was in awe. I mean, I could not take my eyes off the TV. There was cameras, the sets, the dressing rooms, the different lighting setups, all the rigs, the live studio audience. I was like, that is what I'm doing. And I... Wanted ever since I saw that I was, I knew, oh I knew I was gonna make movies, because it's I, I was just amazed by it. It's mm -hmm. so cool, mm -hmm. and then I, you know, continued with that mindset. And in elementary school, 
my neighbor growing up slash best friend uh we got our hands on a flip phone and it recorded video and we would <laughs> make parody commercials and little skits and sketches the black and white flip phone video it's probably in a dumpster somewhere um and then in fifth grade i decided to take it more seriously if you listened to last episode, uh, you would have heard that I was, I'm going to be maid of honor in my best friend's wedding this year. Different from the neighbor. We were all neighbors at one point. Anyway, we decided to form a production company and we took it very seriously. It was called C&N Productions and we wrote scripts. We got all our change together and got one of our moms to drive us to Office Depot. We bought supplies we recruited our friends. It was a whole, whole ordeal. And it went on for years. Uh, when we got a little older, it fizzled out. And we actually got, I, okay, our biggest fight ever wasn't about the production company, but we were writing scripts when it happened. It was the chicken nugget fight. Doesn't What's matter. the chicken nugget fight? <laughs> my, my dad made us chicken nuggets for dinner. And he took a bite out of one. And I tried to give her that plate. I was totally in the wrong. You're <laughs> in the wrong. That's your dad's mouth. <laughs> but I wanted the full chicken nugget. He shouldn't have bit it. It's his fault. Um, but it escalated. It was so ridiculous. Um, that's How long did the chicken nugget fight last? I don't know. At, at the time, it felt like hours. But in reality, it was probably 30 minutes. We were in sixth grade. So. That's so funny. Uh, yeah, your friend was right. I gave her the chicken nuggets eventually, but the fight escalated, so it didn't matter. <laughs> but yeah, we had this production company and kept it going and then fizzled out when we became teenagers. So college time comes around and I didn't want to go to college. I really didn't. I just wanted to go be an actor and make movies and my parents were like you have to go to college and I was like okay well then I'm going to go to conservatory for acting and they're like no you're not and I was like okay well then I'm going to film school and they're like as long as it's a four-year program where you end up with a bachelor's fine because I was I don't want to sound like a, I was very good in school. Uh, so they weren't happy about my decision to go into entertainment. But they have come around because they saw they, I mean, it's been. Your mom is our number one fan on uh, on our social media. Anytime yeah. I post something, I'm like, we're going to get one like. Okay. And it'll be my mom. It's going to be your mom. But my mom came around with the acting when I was growing up, too, because she saw all the effort I put in. And then the same thing happened with filmmaking as I went through college. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, CNN Productions. We love so CNN cute. Productions. Yeah. Almost broken up by a chicken nugget. Uh. Oh, no, the company was fine. Oh, the company <laughs> would have still ran. Yeah. They know how to keep business relationships going. We wrote contracts. <laughs> I'm serious. Oh my gosh. I, I can save these stories for another podcast, but I was a little businesswoman. Oh, I bet. And I did win a contract writing contest in high school. You had a contract writing contest? Yeah, and like the business classes. Well, we didn't have business classes at our school. That's unfortunate. Yeah, we were a county school. Ooh. I was going to double major in college, actually, with one of the business majors, but it would have taken too long, so I didn't. A contract writing award is wild. <laughs> that is. I won gift cards. <laughs> That's so funny. Two gift cards, because I won both categories. How do you even, what, con <laughs> what was the contract? I don't remember. But you were given circumstances and, like, you had like, okay, here's what the deal is. Now write the contract. And I wrote yeah. the contract and I won both categories. <laughs> that's so, that's so funny. 
<laughs> yeah, no, we did not have business classes at our school. Yeah, okay. I took, I don't need to tell you my entire coursework of business. <laughs> But I, I ended up minoring in entrepreneurship and innovation in college. Instead I did of... too. That's so funny. Great minds. Yeah, great minds. Okay. So long story short, freshman Sibel Air. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Well, I also like when I was a kid, my sister and her friends and I, we would all make these little TV shows and films on our old iMac. It was like literally the Mac was like that thick and it was like one of those white boxes and we would just sit there on iMovie and the photo booth thing and we would film these episodes. Yeah. And it was titled, our first one was titled, We Need Help. And like my sister and her best friend were the stars of it, but sometimes they would let me have a part. So, <laughs> what a mean would... older sister. Your oh my background. God. She was brutal to me. I know. I was so background. I'll try to find some clips because it's so cringy and embarrassing. But I was like five or something. And I was just like in the background screaming the whole time, fighting, yelling for my mom. <laughs> But it was fun. So that was my first little experience with filmmaking that's not legit filmmaking. But then... Hey, it's a step. You knew yeah, what you were. Yeah. Yeah. I was just a little sister being dragged along to be abused. But that's what you do as a child. <laughs> also, Jimmy, and for anyone with siblings watching, we can tell you're an only child if you think that's mean. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, you can tell I'm an only child? Yeah, because you said that was mean. Oh, no, that's nothing. Oh, that's nah. true. Nothing compared she, to what? Yeah. Mm, okay. <laughs> I've been strangled before. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, I'm... I've done that. I've done that with, like, my, I was raised with a bunch of friends, and I always had friends in the house, but I was, so I never felt like I was an only child. But, yeah, no, we weren't, like, I mean, we were, like, I don't know. No, yeah, you treat the younger sibling like a dog. And unfortunately, I was the younger sibling. <laughs> Were you treated like a dog, Cheyenne? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I had two older sisters. My oldest sister was nice most of the time. But my other sister and my cousins, uh, -uh I was the baby. <laughs> it was horrible. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Now I w yeah. We had, like, fun bullying with friends, but not not like that. No, yeah, my sister was brutal. She would like, I would be playing dollhouse and like, oh, they're just a sweet little family. And she would walk in and destroy my whole house, make it like <laughs> someone's dangling from a ceiling fan. <laughs> like it was complete destruction That's anytime dramatic. she joined. I know. Oh good gosh. times. There's a lot of good things about having older siblings. Don't get me wrong, but. I know. Yeah. But growing up, it's. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. It's fun. But yeah, so we would do those little videos and then I never was really interested in filmmaking that much until I was like 15 or 16. Because like before I was like, no, I only want to act. I don't want to do anything behind the camera. And then I decided like I had been writing, like I always wrote when I was younger. And I decided that I wanted to write my own film. And I had like one other friend that was like interested in filmmaking and acting. So she was like on board. And then she bailed because I was the only dedicated and motivated person but I ended up writing filming producing directing editing my first short film when I was 16 and I literally did it all in one week because there was this film festival in Huntsville called the Rocket City Short Film Festival and they had a youth that was category. still around then I didn't know that it's been on for a while I didn't know that. so Emily was 16 five years ago so oh. yeah <laughs> oh dear god <laughs> 16 Holy for shit. me what is what is that for us 12 almost 12 years ago i don't like that uh yeah so they had this festival and the deadline was coming up and i had just discovered it and it was like the deadline was in a week and i think i was on fall break actually no i did online school so i didn't have fall break but so i was all online all i did was dance oh it was fall break for dance that's what it was so i got me and one of my other friends who was on the competitive dance team and we made this whole film together in one week and i submitted it to the festival and it got accepted what and then, yeah and i did not know this did you yeah know this? yeah 
I, yeah. I don't remember. Alex has talked about it before, like last year. I don't yeah. think I was there. It was in her bio for Thanks for Coming. Because mm-hmm. she got into the Rocket City Film Fest? I guess, I don't know. Yeah. I guess I just didn't put it together that you like did all of it. Oh, yeah, I did everything. Yeah. I was like headstrong. And that was when I swore off editing. But now I edit every day and I like it. So, yeah, that's what I did. And it went very well. It was extremely cringy. It will never see the light of day. But, like, the judges loved it. And he said that it was, like, comedy genius. Like, they loved it. They hyped it up. They wanted more. They were like, do another one next year. And then I never did. So I'm sad. I grew out of the youth category. And, yeah, so that was my one short film. And that was my first taste of really filmmaking. Do you have the video? Yes, and it's never gonna see the light. I want to see it. I've never no. seen. I don't remember this. <laughs> I must have missed something. That's it so will cool. never be seen. It'll never be seen. Can, Can we, we watch it privately? No. <laughs> Emily, it's come really, on. It's cringy. It was like I did. It cringy's was like, good. Cringy's what gets you to success. You have to be cringy. To go but where you want to go. Embarrassing. It's funny though. I will give it that. It's funny, but it's embarrassing. <laughs> I showed you my but, YouTube channel, and my YouTube channel is way more embarrassing. Yeah, but like you were a kid, I was sixteen. But 16 honestly, sixteen yeah, is a fair. kid. It was it was like the basic, like it was very much YouTube mockumentary, like reality TV style. Like I based it off like me and my friends. We were like kind of like the Kardashians or something, and it was like essentially like a reality TV show. And we were like caught up in this big scandal, so we were like, we have to go like into nature and do our good deeds, and like be good people and it was like a whole play also and like just the culture at the time with all of the cringy like tiktok themes and everything and like trends so yeah it was very it was funny it was funny i'll give it that was tiktok around when you were 16 yeah yeah what that is weird what Mm -hmm. what when did it come out 2019 it was musically before yeah. Oh my God. I was all over Musically too. I was dedicated to Musically. I would make one every single day when I was really? 13 and 14. Yeah. I deleted I mean, all Vine. of them. I you was too old for Musical.ly. Musical.ly. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I was on Vine, but I just watched Vine. I didn't. Yeah. I missed Vine by literally a week because I discovered Vine when I was in seventh grade. And I was like, this is it. I'm going to be a Vine star. And like I was telling my sister and I was like, you've got to get on board. You can be my videographer. And I was like, so ready to like be famous on Vine. And then it literally ended the next week. It was tragic. Oh, so I was like, wow. yeah. So I was like, guess it's musically now. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So that was my filmmaking experience. And it was a very stressful process. I pulled an all nighter to edit the film just to get it in on time. But it was all good. I never wanted to edit again, though. But now I like it. So and I love directing. That's what I learned from that. I was like, you know what, maybe don't wear all the hats next time. But like, I'll direct and produce. Why are we still wearing all the hats then? Yeah, I was about to say nothing's changed. (laughs) We're not editing. We're not editing in the future. So. Yeah. No. We have more helping hands. We do. We, we have PAs. We have people that'll hold a light for us, hold a mic. That's and, yeah. And an incredible DP. So incredible yeah. DP. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I also filmed it on my iPhone. <laughs> so good times. Nice. I've I'm gonna see this. <laughs> Let me watch it one more time and then I can prep myself for being embarrassed and make sure that it's not completely embarrassing. But it's it's not like a film film. Like it's very comedy skit type. That's fine. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> this is like my next greatest nightmare i wrote a poem i did a stand-up comedy routine now people have to watch the film i made when i was 16 there you go there you go <laughs> i hate watching my old stuff i was sitting my old uh things in the tra- chat that are mortifying i'm gonna watch that yeah we can have a watching party tonight yeah we can <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. Send it to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to record it for Cheyenne. I'm going to be like... <laughs> I can't. It's so embarrassing. <sighs> so to wrap things up, we're going to talk about a not obvious thing we're grateful for. So obviously you're grateful for your friends and your family, your dog, whatever. But what's something that's not obvious you're grateful for this week? I think for me, and I don't know if this is going to sound annoying, but it's been running. 
I stopped running. I, I did a half marathon when I was in Taiwan. I don't even know, four years ago. And I stopped running for a really long time. In the past like two months, I have, I've started running again and it's become a part of my daily routine. And I just feel less stressed. I'm happier. Um, I was like planning on getting a walking pad to walk at my desk so I could work longer and also exercise. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to cut myself off at the end of the day and I'm going to go outside for an hour. And it has improved my well-being for the past two months. So yeah, I think for me, it's, it's running. It's um, really, it's made me a better Jimmy. <laughs> Running's the best. It's the best, like the dopamine, like the high that you get when you're running. And the place that I found is on a hill. So it's like you go down and you feel so fast. And then obviously you don't go as fast going up, but like, it's just, I don't know. It's a challenge. It's, it's yeah, running. You can just zone out just like blare your headphones and go mm -hmm. be aware mm -hmm. of your surroundings, but go, oh, yeah. <laughs> but go. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> What about you guys? Well, this will sound like weird after that, but I got to go on a walk for the first time in probably a week and a half today because my RA has been flaring and my feet and my ankles were incredibly swollen and I was in a lot of pain. But I got to go on a walk today because it got bearable enough to go and I got to be outside and it's not the same as running for me. Like it when I would run. you loved running. I did. But after not being able to walk long distances for a little bit, it was just nice to be outside and blur my headphones. Mm -hmm. Where did you walk? Was it like a place close to your house or was it? Yeah, I just go outside and walk on the road. Yeah. There's nothing here. It's just farms. Oh, yeah, you've, you've so. me. <laughs> it's a big green patch. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah there's miles and miles yeah. that I can walk and miles without <laughs> seeing anything so yeah but it's good that is good yeah Emily I don't know a not obvious thing um I don't know I'm just something like in your routine I don't have a routine right now <laughs> I'm building my routine. I'm grateful for that. We're building it. We're making it work. Oh, yeah. I started adding like yoga and stretching back into my life. I did that yesterday before my class. And then I did that today before we filmed. So I'm starting to add that back in because like I used to have a very strong routine and like strict routine because I would always do everything at 100% when I was younger. And then I kind of like fell out of it and especially moving here because like since stop. Like, since I stopped dancing, I started doing pure bar, and I did that every single day in Huntsville. And when we moved here, I just stopped doing everything altogether and then never got back into it. So I'm finally getting back into it. So that's what yeah. I'm grateful for. I get that, Emily. When I was on my run, whenever I got back to L.A. Monday, I was like, I've got to build a routine here. And, like, so I get it. When you yeah, yeah moving. It's time. Yeah. yeah. And it takes time to figure out, you know, your groove. Yeah, mm -hmm. and a new routine because I started a new job and a whole new life. So we're on it, a good track. Mm -hmm. Stretching is really important too. After, you know, when you get in your mid, late 20s, you have to stretch or you will Tight. be insane. Yeah. I know. I was shocked. Like I used to be very flexible and I could like do a lot of dance skills. And actually before I filmed my singing TikTok, I was just doing like dance improv in our living room. And I was like, I can't do anything anymore. I was like, oh no, this is bad. Yeah, like, it'll come back it'll, fast. Yeah, <laughs> it goes so fast, but like it'll come back quick, I hope, because I'm like, ooh, everything hurts. I'm only 21. <laughs> if I don't stretch my left hip, like gets stuck up higher than my right one which is probably a mixture of like injuries from cheer and dance and then with RA mm -hmm. on top of that so I have to like I have to stretch and if it gets too bad Alex has to pull it out <gasps> is that hurt? I can't uh yeah it hurts sometimes like my physical therapist had to teach us how to, to... ah 
Yeah. I hate that. <laughs> Moral of the story, always stretch. Always yeah. stretch. I get because cramps. Yeah. I was stretching still. It just it's just a thing that happens now. <laughs> oh. That's the right scary. age of 30. Approaching 30. Y'all aren't 30 yet. I was gonna say I am 28. I'm 28. See? And if any casting directors are watching, I don't have an no, age. No, we're not. <laughs> we do, we do not have an 20 age. 20 to play 28. Yeah, I'm, I'm 20. Whatever you think I am. Whatever you think I am, <laughs> that's how I am. That'll be it for episode four of the Hags podcast. Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe and like on YouTube. And Jimmy, where can they listen or watch? They can listen on the Hags podcast on Spotify. And coming up, the Hags podcast on Apple, and then the Hags production uh, YouTube channel on our YouTube. And Emily, where can they find us on socials? You can find us at the Hags podcast on TikTok, Instagram, and Hag Productions on Instagram and TikTok. Beautiful. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next Thursday on the Hags podcast. Yay. Goodbye, guys. Bye. 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 Thank you.